Hey everybody, Rhino here, the world's strongest pro bodybuilder and inventor of the cooler. I had such a huge response to my buy one, get one free t-shirt offer in December that I'm renewing it. My signature series effing shit up t-shirts along with the other t-shirts at stanupburning.com are all now two for the price of one. Use bb.com as a discount code. I know it's been a while since my last rant, but I've been working on some exciting things that I wanted to share with everyone. First, you may have noticed that I've joined forces with Bodybuilding.com, and they'll be helping me bring Rhino's Rants to their enormous audience worldwide. I'd like to welcome the Bodybuilding.com viewers, and I encourage you to watch my previous rants, which are loaded with helpful information. Thousands of viewers from all over the world have reached out to me through social media and in person at the expos and competitions I attend, and they've been sharing their success stories and thanking me for the helpful tips and I'm sincerely humbled by all the enthusiasm. If you're a first time viewer, let me start with my disclosure. These rants are simply my advice from my experience. It comes from 30 years of competing, learning, and coaching. It's important to keep in mind that not everybody responds the same, and there are many paths to the same destination. It's also important to recognize that almost every single diet, supplement, and exercise program imaginable has peer-reviewed publications associating it with almost any outcome. For this reason, I'm keenly aware of the information that I provide in my rants is nothing more than my opinion. So with that, I welcome you. The second piece of exciting news has been over four months in the making and it was just advertised last week by ABC so I can finally announce it. The Rhino, that's me, and my cooler will be appearing on Shark Tank. What, what, yeah. That's right, Friday, February 3rd at 6 p.m. You can watch me pitch my cooler to the sharks. Now here's a clip of the commercial that my friend sent me. No, no, the fact that she made that decision proves that she's terrific. Next time on Shark Tank, together we can crush the competition. Wow! Yay. She knows cash flow when she sees it. I know your history, I know what you're capable of doing. Oh. At any given time, a shark can turn into a bottom eating catfish. Yeah. Oh. Oh my. <laughs> should I beat you up now or should we wait? What am I going to do? There's a lot of noise here. <laughs> I'll be sure to follow up with the rant after the show airs to share what goes on behind the scenes, along with my secrets to success that have helped me turn three startup companies into multi million dollar businesses. As for today's rant, I want to discuss the real reason Oprah Winfrey lost weight, and it's not Weight Watchers. Many of us started the new year with one or more resolutions, and weight loss is typically at the top of that list. Whether you've already started or intend to start working towards your resolution, I think it's important to understand the keys to success. Well, let's be absolutely clear before we get started. Genetics reign supreme. Some people have a faster metabolism than others. Some people gain weight easier than others. Everything I talk about here, as in any of my rants, is secondary. And that's no different than everything else in the health and fitness industry. It's all impact, impacted first and foremost by genetics. And there's nothing you can do to change that. You just have to play the cards you've been dealt and do your very best to maximize your potential. So as many of you are aware, Oprah recently announced that she lost 40 pounds and credited her success to Weight Watchers. I'm always happy to hear when someone makes progress or achieves their goals. Typically the first question most people ask is, how did you do it? Or what's the secret? Unfortunately, in Oprah's case, the vast majority of the comments, or at least those on social media, were negative. Most people remarked about the fact that she'll gain it all back because she's been on a dieting roller coaster for decades or they accused her of profiteering since she's an investor in Weight Watchers, or that they could lose weight too if, if they had a full-time cook and personal trainer. I hate internet trolls as much as the next guy, but in fairness, all of those things are partly true. Oprah famously unveiled her first 67 pound weight loss nearly 30 years ago in 1988. It was her highest rated show in history. At the time, she credited her success to Optifast, and yes, she gained it all back. But it wasn't the diet's fault, any more than it's Weight Watchers that deserves credit for Oprah's recent success. 
Nearly everyone that goes on almost any diet loses weight, and the vast majority of them gain it all back. Keeping it off is the real challenge. As I discussed in my obesity rant, the formula is very simple. Move more, eat less. Shortly after I released my obesity rant, Stephen Hawkins posted this video on YouTube. At the moment, humanity faces a major challenge, and millions of lives are in danger. As a cosmologist, I see the world as a whole, and I am here to address one of the most serious public health problems of the 21st century. Today too many people die from complications related to overweight and obesity. We eat too much, and move too little. Fortunately, the solution is simple. More physical activity, and change in diet. It's not rocket science. And for what it's worth, how being sedentary has become a major health problem is beyond my understanding. Thank you for that, Stephen. And if you need any advice on quantum mechanics, I'm here for you, man. Now, I received hundreds of thousands of views on my obesity rant that Mark Bell posted, along with a thousand comments. Many people remarked about all sorts of variables that affect weight loss, including genetics, hormones, blood sugars, metabolic damage, lack of sleep, emotional and psychological factors, and many others. I've talked about most of these factors in depth throughout my rants, and they always bring us full circle back to where we started. To lose weight, you have to create a calorie deficit, either by restricting calories or by exercising, and ideally a combination of both. It's also important to recognize that many of the health issues that affect us, such as sleep apnea, high blood pressure, high blood sugars and cholesterol, insulin resistance, and even some hormone deficiencies are most often just symptoms of obesity. And when you lose weight, many of those issues improve dramatically or completely go away. The good news is that most diets work for most people. The real challenge is keeping it off. And that is ultimately the most important part of any diet, maintenance. But which diet is the best? As I've said before, the best diet is the one you'll follow. There are literally thousands of different diets, whether it be weighing your food, counting calories, portion control, a point system like Weight Watchers, restricting or eliminating macros like carbs in the keto diet, intermittent fasting or only eating between certain hours, consuming low calorie, highly satiating foods, clean eating, and if it fits your macros. They all have the same goal, to reduce calories. And wisely, they all recommend a regular exercise program of varying degrees of frequency and intensity. I'm well aware of all the variables involved in dieting and exercise, and I've utilized many of those methods myself and on my clients over the years. And I've studied the research, but I'm well aware that first and foremost, all of these programs that are effective for weight loss do require maintaining a calorie deficit. So the real question is, which diet works for you? Now, when diets are ranked for effectiveness, the primary factors are whether or not the diet is easy to follow. Was it convenient? Was it flexible? Did you enjoy the taste of the food? In other words, is it sustainable? The vast majority of the diets are deemed to be healthy, and by that I mean they're not overly restrictive on calories like that horrible 500 calorie HCG diet, and they weren't likely to cause a deficiency in micronutrients. Since most diets work, this is why I say that Oprah didn't lose weight because of Weight Watchers. She lost weight because she ate less and moved more. She had a plan and she stuck to it. She used a points program to monitor her caloric intake and she exercised more using a tracker to ensure that she walked 10,000 steps a day. She lost weight because she was disciplined and consistent. Oprah herself acknowledges that her struggle with her weight is largely due to overeating. 
She uses food for comfort as a result of some very difficult experiences that she had while growing up. Now, I know this is obvious and repetitive, but the reason it's important is because the more complicated we make it, the less successful we are. And it's also necessary to focus on the real task at hand because losing weight is not the challenge. Keeping it off is the challenge. I spoke before about the competitors on The Biggest Loser. All of them lost weight. They lost a lot of weight, but most of them gained it back. I acknowledge that the weight loss program they used was unsustainable, so they eventually gave up, went back to their old habits, and gained the weight back. Those that were able to keep it off didn't have any secrets to offer. They said they had to watch everything they ate and they had to exercise every day. I hate when the food Nazis weigh in and claim that a certain food is terrible or even an entire food group. I'm guilty of it myself, as in the case of my rant on processed vegetable oils. I also restrict some food items for my clients' diets that have food allergies. But generally speaking, it's far less about what you eat and more about how much you eat that's of primary importance. I've pointed out that the educators who ate exclusively at McDonald's or 7-Eleven but limited their calories and exercise daily not only lost over 40 pounds, but they also improved all of their health markers such as blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugars. I spoke on Mark Bell's PowerCast recently about the Amish, who for 300 years have been eating bacon, ham, real butter, whole eggs cooked in lard, raw milk, pancakes, and molasses every day. And they only have 4% obesity, while over 35% of Americans are overweight or obese. The Amish also have a much lower rate of heart disease and nearly half the rate of cancer when measured as a whole. The main reason for this is that the Amish eat less and move more. Studies have shown that they sit less and move nearly twice as much as Americans, regularly averaging nearly 20,000 steps a day. And they continue this activity level much longer into their older years. I think it's true that you can't outwork a bad diet. An hour of walking will earn you about a piece of bread. But if you control your calories and keep your body fat down, Something as simple as walking regularly can drastically improve your quality of life and decrease your exposure to all-cause mortality. I take a brisk 10-minute walk after each of at least three or four of my daily meals. Research suggests that this improves digestion and reduces blood sugars, much better than a single 40-minute walk daily. Science is telling us that consistency is more important than intensity and frequency is more important than quantity. Getting up every hour and walking around is better than exercising once at the end of the day. And it's not just for weight loss. For my powerlifting and strongman friends out there, I use the same recommendation for the world's strongest man competitor, Hofthor Bjornsson, who most people know as Mountain from HBO series Game of Thrones. I recommended the frequent daily walks to improve his insulin sensitivity and to aid with digestion and speed up recovery from hard training. He used this method, method along with the calorie surplus to increase his weight from 395 pounds to 420 pounds and he's stronger than ever and feels great. When I retired from powerlifting I was nearly 300 pounds. I lost 40 pounds in about 40 days simply by reducing my calories and walking every day. My blood sugars have significantly improved using the frequent short walks and by correcting my vitamin D deficiency as I outlined in a previous rant. Sitting is a disease. Movement is the holy grail of health. Blood flow is the life force that heals our body and removes the waste. No juice cleanse or apple cider vinegar or lemon water will compensate for inactivity. You don't need 50 different food items from 12 different countries or a rare plant or berry from some remote island or jungle. That's just another example of our desire to find things that do the work for us passively. Thinking we can just eat a superfood and that will somehow make up for inactivity when we know that regular exercise and maintaining a healthy body fat level is the real key to long-term health. 
If you're disciplined enough to stay on a meal prep plan, like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig for 60 or 90 days, then you're also disciplined enough to continue on a responsible meal plan where you educate yourself about calories and portion sizes and continue to eat a reasonable amount and exercise and make the choices necessary to maintain weight loss as part of the healthy lifestyle. I refer to a lot of these programs as training wheels. It's a good way to get started and learn how to eat correctly. And eventually when you take the training wheels off, you have the knowledge and the discipline necessary to maintain a more flexible program that allows you to keep the weight off. We just stop doing it for a variety of reasons. We return to our bad habits and gain the weight back. As a trainer, I make it my job to provide clients with the knowledge they need to maintain their results without my help. There's two things that I've found over the years that are most effective for losing weight and keeping it off. One is meal prep. Whether that means you use a packaged food plan from Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, or you purchase from a meal prep company, or you do it yourself. This can include having some smart meal choices predetermined when you have to eat out at a restaurant during the day. That can also be considered meal prep. I've always found that having the day's meals all portioned out ahead of time helps reduce poor choices. My wife and I have been together for nearly 17 years, and for most of that time, she struggled with her weight. She's Samoan, and I joke that she can gain weight just looking at food. She's always had a difficult time losing weight, and she's been on and off that roller coaster dozens of times throughout the years. She's discovered that when she meal preps, she loses weight. When she doesn't, she gains weight. I found the same to be true with the vast majority of clients I've worked with. My business partner travels a lot, so meal prepping is much more difficult for him. So I took him to many of the restaurants he typically eats at and showed him which menu items to order and how much of each one he could eat. He was able to lose 20 pounds in 30 days without eating a single meal at home. Research tells us that we're a terrible judge of calories and portion size. Just using an 8-inch plate instead of a 12-inch plate has been shown to reduce the number of calories we eat by as much as a third. So for the best results, plan ahead. Know exactly what you're going to eat for the day and have it ready for yourself. Second is regular exercise. I've said before that when I'm asked what the best exercise is to lose weight, my answer is the one you'll do. My wife got bored with the cardio machines and weightlifting at the gym, so consistency was always a challenge. But when she tried Olympic lifting, CrossFit, and HIIT training, she loved it. She turned exercise from a chore into something she looked forward to doing. The best thing about this type of training for her is that it changed her goal from trying to be thin to trying to be more athletic, and she loved the way it changed her body. I like to say that form follows function. And if someone really enjoys a particular exercise routine or sport and will do it often, that their body will change to become better at that exercise or sport. And their focus also changes. My wife stopped looking at the scale and started focusing on her performance. The challenge was no longer overcoming the monotony of an hour on the treadmill. Instead, she was eager to see how much she could clean and press or snatch or beat her last wad time or how many sets of 20s she could do with a particular weight on the squats. Now after six months of this CrossFit style training and working very hard and sticking to her diet, she went from 170 pounds to 170 pounds. But as you can see, her body completely changed. She gained muscle, lost fat, lost inches, and gained a lot of self-confidence. Fortunately, professional female athletes like Serena Williams, singers and actresses like Jennifer Lopez, as well as full figure models and strong muscular CrossFit athletes have also prov helped provide women different definitions of what it means to be in good shape. Thin isn't the only option anymore. Women have embraced their curves and it's gone a long ways to ease the burden of trying to fit into a one size fits all approach to dieting and exercise. I know some health professionals are stuck in the 1980s and keep dragging out the body mass index to suggest a healthy weight for your height, but that index is as worthless as the glycemic index. First of all, it doesn't account for muscle mass, and more importantly, it doesn't address your cardiovascular health and where you carry your body fat. Women genetically have more capacity to store fat than men, 
That's part of their genetics that makes them capable of being able to provide nutrition for their child during pregnancy. And more importantly, storing fat in the hips and legs is not associated with the same health problems as belly fat. The studies have shown that people with belly fat that are not technically obese are more likely to die from heart disease than obesity. Women live longer than men, usually because, even though they have a higher body fat, because they store more of that fat in their hips and butt and not in their belly. Men tend to store fat in their belly, and belly fat has significant consequences. Belly fat starts to accumulate in the liver, the pancreas, and the muscles. And that's when they start having real health issues like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and heart disease. So when Sir Mix-a-Lot said, little in the middle, but you got much back, who knew he was starting a fitness revolution? Well, you know I'm running out of material when I start quoting Sir Mix-a-Lot, so let me leave you with this. Don't look at a diet as something temporary that you will go off when you reach your goal. Look at your food choices and portion sizes as part of a healthy lifestyle. Find something active that you enjoy doing and make sure it's sustainable. Be consistent, move more, and eat less. That's how Oprah lost weight. Now, if only we could help the internet trolls to love more and hate less. Well, that's my rant, and as always, thanks for listening.